U.S. Department of Education, this is Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Tony Miller, Deputy Secretary of Education. We are here with hundreds of students in celebration of International Education Week. How do you hear me? I hear you well. It's a little broken, but it's great to hear you and great to hear all the kids there. Well, great. It really is exciting to be able to connect with you. Uh, let's get started. I'd like to invite the first student to come up and ask the first question. And this question is from Allie at Chug Hart Middle. Do you prefer living on Earth or in space? Hey, that, that's a great question, and welcome aboard the International Space Station. You know, this is something I've dreamed about my entire life, and so for right now, while it's my turn to be here, I'm glad I'm here, and I, I've dreamed about this, and I'm proud to be here. I have a big job to do, and so this is where I want to be right now. I'm also looking forward to going home in two weeks. I've been up here for uh, five months. As of yesterday, we launched five months ago, and so it's been a long time away from home and I'll, I'm looking forward to going home. And once I get home, it's time to be there. And so I look forward to being back on my favorite planet, Earth. My name's Elena, and my question is, how did your childhood, education, Elena, and peers influence your decision to join your NASA? Now, that's an interesting question. I grew up in the day, early days of the space age. I was born two months after the, the first satellite was launched into space, the Russian satellite known as uh, Sputnik, and grew up during the days when we were working toward the moon, and, and I remember watching the moon landings and dreaming about what it would be like to do that. And when I was about 12 years old, I was a Boy Scout on a camp out, out away from the city lights. I remember kind of laying on a hillside, looking up at the stars and feeling like I was in the middle of them. And that's when it really became kind of a personal dream for me to, to do this kind of crazy thing. But there was uh, people that thought I was, uh, you know, thought this was impossible, thought it was a little crazy. Uh, but there were a lot of people who really encouraged me, too. I had some uh, uh, scout leaders and teachers who encouraged me a lot along the way, as well as uh, family and friends who really knew me and really believed in me. Then, and that, that made all the difference in the world. Hi, my name is Anuleka, and my question is, what is it like to be away from your family and people you love? Well, it is hard to be away from the, uh, my family, especially for, uh, for a long period of time like this. It's uh, a lot like, you know, days in the military when you're deployed and you, you're away from family for a long time. I'm glad to be here. I have an important job to do, and I'm proud to be doing this job and living my dream. But the, the one downside is really to be away from my family. I miss uh, my wife and my kids and my uh, baby granddaughter who was born just a few weeks before I left. I'm staying in touch with them you know, on the phone and email and my daughter sends me videos and uh, I can't wait to uh, get home and uh, hug that little munchkin. Hi, my name is Ian and my question is, without manned launches at the Cape, are American astronauts going to do space missions with other countries and will they be training in Europe? Uh, yes, indeed. We are training and launching from other places. Uh, the training for the International Space Station flight, I went, went through all of the basic training. Once I got assigned to the flight, it was uh, two and a half years of training. And that was really around the globe, you know, in the United States, in Canada, in Germany, in Japan, and a lot in Russia. Because I didn't launch here. I didn't come here on a space shuttle. I came here this time on a Russian Soyuz rocket which is a very different experience. And so I, I had the opportunity to live and work in Russia and train over there for many months in preparation for this. And what a great experience it's been in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, it, and for me, you know, growing up in the days that, that, that I grew up, you know, and uh, the whole idea of flying on a Russian rocket and having the freedom to, to move around in Russia and, and visit Moscow and all of those things is that's about as mind blowing as flying in space is, really. So it's uh, that, and that's where we are right now because the US, United States does not have a human launch capability. We have, uh, we're dependent on the Russians really for a human launch right now and a lot of cargo. There's also cargo ships uh, that are launched from Japan and Europe uh, that, that come up here. Uh, and the U.S. has a couple of companies that are very close to uh, beginning to deliver cargo 
which we need here on the space station. And there's se several teams that are working very hard on coming up with a human launch capability from the United States. I think we need that. I really applaud you know, those efforts and look forward to supporting those efforts when I get home. Isabel, this is a question from Aaron. Do you feel more energetic in space as compared to working on Earth? Okay, Aaron, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure I could tell anymore. I've been up here so long, I'm completely adapted. I'm now a, a, uh, you know, I'm now a space being, I think. In ways, maybe more energetic because the days are just busy. We wake up at six o'clock in the morning. We have a, a bunch of things we, we need to do early in the morning, uh, actually checking on some experiments. Uh, and preparing for the day. And then we're working really hard all day long. We get a short break for lunch, and, and then we're working and into dinner and, and past that a little bit. So the days are so busy, time flies by. And, and so you just have to be going constantly. And so I think my energy level is pretty high up here. Uh, but it's, it's pretty high on the Earth, too. Uh, physically, it's easier to be here, though, because we just float, you know? And, and so I don't have to hold my body up while I'm moving around and doing things. Sometimes it's kind of hard to hold my body still while I'm doing things, and that's a different thing, because when I push on something, I push on it, and it, it pushes me away from it. And so sometimes it gets a little hard and frustrating to do things up here. In general, though, I think it's a little easier uh, physically living up here than living on the ground. But you also have to be ready to come back to the ground, too. My name is Ginny. And my question is from Alexis at Maxwell Air Force Base. Um, how much space debris do you see? And does it pose a danger to the space station? Hey, Alexis. We don't, I, I've never seen space debris that I know was space debris. I've seen satellites uh, in the uh, close to dawn, just like you can uh, on the ground. On the ground, you can see us, the space station, and you can see satellites uh, if it's just within an hour or two hours after sunset or just before sunrise. When we're in the light up here and the ground is dark, uh, we had actually uh, last night we flew over Houston and my family went outside to, or two nights ago, to see us as we flew over the top. And so I was talking to them while it was, it, we were in the sunlight up here, but it was already dark at home. So, so space debris tends to be smaller than satellites and stuff. We can't see it. It is a threat though. It is a threat. And the ground is tracking thousands of pieces of old satellites and things like that that would be a threat to us. Uh, several times we've had to do some maneuvers where we changed the orbit of the space station to get out of the way or get, get further away from a piece of uh, space junk. And there was one time, I, I think it was uh, back around the end of June, where we actually found out about a piece of space junk that was coming toward us, getting kind of close. Uh, and we're not certain exactly where, how close it's going to be because these things are, uh, are hard to measure from the ground. But it was too, it, we learned about it uh, with, without enough time to actually change the orbit to avoid it. And so that was a little bit scary. We had to close all of the hatches on the space station and then go into our Soyuz spacecraft just in case part of the space station got hit so we would be safe and uh, be ready to come home if we needed to. Hello, my name's Kate. And after my grandfather had a stroke, he underwent lots of physical therapy so that his muscles didn't atrophy. I've heard that the same is true for being in space. If so, is there an exercise regimen that you must do to limit the amount of muscle degradation? Kate, that's very good insight and a good comparison because yes, indeed, we are in, in conditions up here that are very much like bed rest or somebody with an ailment like your grandfather. Uh, and so we do have to do exercises. Now, lifting weights doesn't make much sense up here where everything's weightless. Uh, but we have a kind of a, it's, it's similar to a universal gym that you might see that has, uh, it, it uses pressure cylinders and then kind of a series of levers and stuff. And we could do a lot of exercises that are very valuable and very beneficial for us on that. So that's the resistive exercise that helps uh, keep our muscles strong 
And it also helps our bones because you put that load on your bones. Right now, when I'm just floating around in here, my bones aren't doing their job. On the ground for you right now, your bones are holding you up, and that stimulates the bones to keep them strong. Up here, we lose bone mass. We begin to lose bone mass in hours, uh, within hours of arriving in, in, uh, in space. And so we have to stimulate those bones through this kind of exercise. And we do aerobic exercise for our heart and lungs and cardiovascular system using an exercise bike. I actually have it, it's right here, the exercise bikes in this room. And we have a treadmill. You, you might think it's odd that we have a treadmill and we obviously can't just step onto it and start running. We have to use a harness that's a lot like a backpacking harness and then this series of cords, it's like bungee, stretchy bungee cords that hold us down to the treadmill so we can run. And that's how we keep our heart and lungs healthy. And we have to do that every day. One of the experiments I'm doing up here is actually as a guinea pig, or I'm the guinea pig, for a, a new exercise uh, uh, plan or schedule. Uh, at less time doing the exercise, but harder or higher intensity. And so instead of just going out and running for an hour, I will go run wind sprints on the treadmill and things like that. And uh, it seems to be working out really well. I'm, I'm excited about the, the program. It's a hard one to be a, be a subject in because that means I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I do a lot of sweating, but it's, a, it's really good research. And it has paybacks too, because they can study in me in a few months what takes place in patients and people on the ground over, over you know, long, longer periods of time or even years. And so by studying my body's response up here in this six month time, we can use that then to help other people, hopefully like your grandfather. It's Julia, and my question is, do you have to speak other languages on the ISS? Yeah, Julia, that, that, that's a very interesting question because it is the International Space Station. There's 15 countries working together in partnership here. Right now on board the space station, we have one American, one Japanese astronaut, and one Russian cosmonaut. And so you're, you will likely hear all three languages in a given day. There's more Russian and, uh, and, uh, and English being spoken. Every once in a while, uh, now Satoshi and the Japanese ground control team are very fluent in English. But every once in a while, if they get into something that's uh, very complicated and hard to translate, they'll switch over to Japanese. I don't know any Japanese. Not, I can't get much further than good morning. Uh, but we, we are required to learn uh, Russian and become uh, achieve a certain level of proficiency in the Russian language. That's because we're launching on a Russian rocket. And the displays and controls in that spaceship are all in Russian, as are the procedures. And so we have to be able to work as part of that spacecraft crew to get to and from the space station. Uh, it, it is interesting, though, if you listen to a conversation with the three of us, you'll hear uh, constantly hear a mix of Russian and English being spoken with people, you know, preferring to speak their native tongue, but the other guys have enough understanding of it to understand what they're saying, but not quite enough over the edge maybe to speak it as fluently. And so it would be real confusing for somebody that, that didn't understand Russian to listen to us uh, having a discussion over lunch. And I think that learning another language like that is really, really important, and we don't, I don't think we pay enough attention to that, that, that learning another language really opens, opens your mind up to another culture, to another way, to other ideas that can't be expressed in English, and it makes the world a much more enjoyable place if you have the chance to go to another place and use this language and really enjoy uh, everything there is to benefit from there. My name is Angela and my question is, what types of experiments have you been working on and what have you learned from them? Hey Angela, that, that, that's a very, worth, uh, very good question. We're standing, or I'm, I'm floating in the, uh, the U.S. laboratory right now. I'm surrounded by different experiments. Right above me here is a furnace that, that uh, it takes uh, special metal samples. It heats them up to very high temperatures and then it's a, it has a very complicated mechanism inside that allows, well, the heating and cooling of these rod, these sample rods at different rates and they can measure what happens to the metals. In gravity, when you heat metals up, when you melt things, the, the, the liquids will settle out based on their density where the, the heavier stuff will settle to the bottom lighter stuff rises to the top and you get these currents that are moving inside your 
your, your sample. Up here, you don't have that, and so you get a much more pure uh, crystals, when, even metal, and you can't see it, but metals, when they cool off, they crystallize, and you can learn a lot about these things. Right here is a combustion facility. We burn fires in there. It's all contained inside a special test chamber, but it's that test chamber is surrounded by cameras and, and special instruments, and we're studying the flames, and not just not, not simple flames, but the physics of a flame and really getting in, because on Earth there's a lot of the processes in a flame that are driven by gravity and buoyancy forces, and up here we don't have that. And they're studying what's, what's called the flame boundary, it was what conditions are, are, are flames stable and, and, and when do they become unstable? And they, they're unlocking the physics of the flame with the hope of learning more about producing combustion uh, 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 burners and heaters on the earth that are a little more efficient. If you could find a way to make them just a fraction of a percent more efficient on earth, you'd be saving you know, millions or billions of dollars every year in energy costs. So it's things like that. We've got plant growth going on. We have fluid physics things. Uh, fluid physics experiments going on, as well as, you know, guys like me that are the guinea pig where they're studying my muscles and bones. There's a, a lot of great stuff going on up here. Commander, you've got uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Tony Miller coming back to you. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your service, for your willingness to be a guinea pig, <laughs> um, and for the real inspiration uh, that you're providing both to, to me and to the students here. Uh, it's, uh, you know, what you and the crew are doing and the importance of science and the importance of, of doing it in an international and global way really is uh, a great kickoff to our International Education Week and I uh, really appreciate your time given your busy schedule. Well, thank you very much. The questions have been outstanding. These, these kids are, they are paying attention, they are thinking, they're obviously uh, questioning the world around them and how it works and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, technology gets a bad rap sometimes because technology has some downsides and we, we, we hear about that in terms of potential global warming sources, pollution, uh, energy uh, crises and things like that. But the, solution, the solutions for tomorrow really come from technology too, finding ways to do that energy a little cleaner, a little cheaper, uh, another way, finding ways to be better stewards of our air, our water our natural resources. And those, those things are going to come from technology. The things that math and science, uh, uh, you know, and uh, engineering can lead you to. And I encourage the kids, there's no dream that's too big. I grew up in one of the poorest parts of the country on the border of South Texas. And I had a, a crazy dream about flying in space. And here I am today as a commander of the International Space Station. There is no dream that's too crazy. There really isn't. You can do it. Follow your passion ask the questions, and work. Dig in and enjoy the journey because it's a fantastic journey and uh, we need you to be out there thinking and engaged and helping us for the days ahead. Thank you very much. Perhaps one last thing. I, I understand there's something called stupid astronaut tricks. Oh, yes. There's stupid astronaut tricks. How about a chocolate covered, or, or a candy coated chocolate can peanut here? We're going to chase it down. You guys probably don't believe I'm really in space. Thank you very much. You've been a great crowd, and uh, keep asking those questions, and keep, uh, keep studying, keep learning, keep growing.